President Tim Boyd, brothers and sisters. Born on 9 June 1942 in Kolkata in an affluent Bengali family, Kalyan Banerjee's extraordinary intelligence, grasping power, and hard work took him from Ravindranath Tagore's Shanti Niketan to Sindhya School to IIT Kharagpur, from where he graduated as a chemical engineer. Immediately, he joined Excel Industries in Mumbai, where he met his mentor, Raju Bhai Shroff, and both of them became trailblazers for building one of India's best multinational corporation, UPL, which has a turnover of about 35,000 crores annually or $5 billion, with 88% of it coming from the 133 countries where they have a customer base. Mr. Banerjee is a director of UPL and chairman of United Phosphorus Bangladesh Limited. He joined Rotary at Wapi in Gujarat 1971, became a very creative club president in 75-76, an outstanding governor in 1980-81, a director of Rotary International in 1995-97, an international trustee of the Rotary Foundation from 2000 to 2005, and its international president in 2011-12. He was instrumental in removing polio from India and innumerable community service projects, humanizing the subject of his talk today, service above self. A very modest Mr. Banerjee says with humility that his contribution to the human society is only like a pebble dropping into the Indian Ocean. I feel that the ripples generated by that pebble have reached all the shores of human civilization as he visited more countries for humanitarian service than any other Rotary president. He is married to a very service-oriented ideal housewife, Binotaji, a perfect match for him. They have an environmental engineer son, Kanishka, settled in Australia, and an MBA daughter, Ruma, settled in Canada. They have four grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, a brilliant engineer, a leading businessman, a great rotary leader, an outstanding orator, a marvelous motivator, a super social worker, a role model for the youth, and a true gentleman, Kalyan Banerjee. International President, uh, Mr. Tim Boyd, my good friend, Pradeep, who, as usual, exaggerates, especially when introducing me, and my brothers and sisters of the Theosophical Society. Let me begin in the traditional Indian way with Namaskar, which means I'm bowing to the Lord who resides in both you and me. In other words, I bow to the divine in you. I'm both honored and delighted to be at the Theosophical Society in Varanasi this evening at its 144th International Convention to deliver the annual Annie Besant Lecture. I speak today on the theme, Service Above Self, and I thank you for your kind invitation and your excellent hospitality here in Varanasi. I must confess, however, that when my Rotary, former Rotary colleague, who is uh, president of the Indian section of the society, invited me to present this lecture today, I was a bit taken aback. True, Mr. Gohil is a friend who knows me well, but he also knows that I am not aware of the Theosophical Society and what it stands for and what it does. So how could I do justice to this invitation 
especially at such a prestigious annual event where luminaries such as the late Mrs. Indira Gandhi had also spoken. But Pradeep said, Kalyan Bhai, in Gujarat, we always add that suffix, Bhai, which means brother, as we address our colleagues. Kalyan Bhai, you can just talk about service above self, and uh, which is the universal motto of Rotary International. That is an area where our objectives possibly merge the most. And so I accepted his kind offer, though, with some trepidation, I must admit. In fact, when Mr. Tim Boyd, the international president of the Theosophical Society, graciously reconfirmed this invitation, he did mention that the length of my talk would be about 50 minutes to an hour. This further concerned me because in Rotary, even at the international fora, we usually talk for around 15 to 25 minutes. And over the years, I've been kind of conditioned to adhering to that schedule. So today, as I speak on the subject of service above self, please forgive me if I fall short both in my presentation's duration as well as your expectations. At this point, let me make a confession. While I had heard, of course, of the Theosophical Society, I confess I knew little about its objectives and activities. And so I quietly did what anyone does today to know something about anything. I googled, and I found that the society was founded in 1875 in the United States by Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott. It came to India four years later in 1879 in Adyar in Madras, and it calls for universal brotherhood without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. The society explores the unexplained laws of nature and the powers that lie in all humans and its aims at the search of the Hindu spiritual wisdom through rational thinking. Theosophy indicates that justice and love guide all cosmos and the universe. And that, that led me to believe further. For universal brotherhood without distinction of race, color, and creed, caste or sex, set me thinking that this is just what Rotarians also believe. Rotarians, in fact, with their families, come together once a year at their annual conventions, which are held in selected cities around the world. The one last year was held in Hamburg, Germany, and the one this year is coming up in Honolulu in the United States in the next five months. And these are memorable experiences for participants who come from all the, of the Rotary countries of the world, 230 plus countries today, in friendship and fellowship they come. And though the proceedings get translated into six languages simultaneously, participants don't wait really for those translations. They smile, they shake hands, they take pictures, they put them on Facebook and YouTube, all in an amazing display of friendship, hugging and embracing and sharing bread together, exchanging visiting cards and notes. People who meet in conventions don't want their friendships to end there. So they exchange their ideas on, on how to help one another, solve one another's problems and meet their needs. Americans and Koreans, for instance, come forward to help Indians get over their water scarcity through building check dams or providing modern techniques of preserving water. All, of course, at no cost, but done only as friends. Rotarians from Israel tell us how to conserve water and use scarce water like no one else does in the world. Indians, on the other hand, go with their expert Rotarian doctors and equipment to Africa. This is friendship through service at its mostest, if I may call it that. When I see this kind of getting together, I remember our wonderful maxim of Vasudeva Kutumbakam from Maha Upanishad. Because in Rotary, through Rotary, the whole world is indeed one family. 
I remember the great historian Arnold Toynbee saying that the brotherhood of man presupposes the fatherhood of God. A unique characteristic of Rotary is that a Rotary Club invites as its individual members the top achiever of his profession or creed in the community. The best lawyer, the top surgeon, the most accomplished teacher, the most successful business person of the community, the Mohalla, as we call it in India, they're all there. They're all super achievers, the community's leaders, the doers. And they're always expected to govern themselves to maintain the highest standards in society, to perform as its movers and shakers. Yes, but also to always maintain the highest levels of integrity and propriety too. But as leaders always, they're under the microscope. They're always watched, critiqued, and often copy, copied and emulated if they do well. Let me give an example. In the recent state elections in Maharashtra, the aged leader of a particular political party campaigned very hard, speaking through torrential rains at some rallies, braving the staring sun at others, and was noticed and appreciated by everyone. It wasn't a surprise then that his party then won a very tough contest in a surprise results. Service to others is part of the reason why we are born, is what we believe in Rotary. Indeed, if you look carefully, you will find that those who engage in service above self, which indeed is what Rotary is all about, if they are business person, for them, profit comes from the revenue that they earn from the products or the service they market, minus the cost to make the product or to render the service. In other words, revenue, less cost, is profit, which is the excess of revenue over cost. That's fine. Now, if that profit is reinvested if in the business, maybe to buy better machines, more machines, or to improve the process, or to train the workers, or to raise their wages and reward them more, they then help to create more employment and create more profit, which then again goes to further expand the cycle of profit to reinvest to more profit and to greater overall prosperity. This is a situation which is a win-win for everyone the business person, his workers, and for the community too, because higher inputs, and for his country as well, with a better GNP, which, as you know, stands for gross national product. And if one can sustain this process, the business, the worker, the society, the country, they all rise together. That is, that is again, Rotary at its mostest. Indeed, life at its best. If, on the other hand, he who profits alone keeps the profits for himself, shares nothing, he only burns the relationships. He loses increasingly all connectivity. He loses his friends, his business. Indeed, his children too, because he doesn't share. And he may die a lonely old man because his single-minded pursuit of profit has driven everyone away. The empire he has built stands then to collapse. Look at Bill Gates Jr., who gave up his work in Microsoft to pursue his goal of making the world free of diseases like polio, like malaria, of malnutrition. Today, Others continue his Microsoft, and profits are still pouring in, more, not less. Bill Gates continues to be the world's richest man, but he spends his money in causes to cure, to serve, to change lives. We in Rotary have, in fact, have another maxim. He profits most who serves best, we say. We have seen this happen every time, everywhere without exception. Azim Premji, one of India's five wealthiest persons, started with making oil for food and machinery for the same. He moved on over the years to making software. 
but he and his family always have maintained the highest standards of integrity, propriety. Whether, uh, you know, the, the others who started rich but didn't always care to maintain the highest standards, whether in running airlines or in making alcohol or in running chit funds, invariably soon ran into difficulties and had to close down. I'm not naming names here, but you can surely draw your own conclusions. In Rotary, we have benefited significantly by sticking to our very unique, but a very simple four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Which simply ask of the decisions one makes, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Is it beneficial to all concerned? And will it build goodwill and better friendships? We have found that the test applies evenly to any query we may have. We, very simply and quite adequately. If something we are considering doesn't pass the test, we just bypass it. Indeed, the four-way test drive home the core values of Rotary, <coughs> which are service, fellowship, diversity, integrity, and leadership. One project that passed the four-way test was our decision to eradicate polio. We all know that smallpox is a disease that no longer exists, exists or occurs in our planet. It was eliminated with the help of WHO, World Health Organization, an affiliate of the United Nations around 1976. Could I have some water? <coughs> Since then, WHO, UNICEF and other international agencies of health have been struggling hard to eradicate another dreaded childhood disease, one that kills less but cripples more, and indeed cripples forever, poliomyelitis. Rotary, the organization of well-meaning professional people, thank you, existing in 210 countries, thought it could be done, first in 1985, and in fact, then got WHO and UNICEF to join our hands to take up the task. In those days, 385,000 children or more around the world either died, either died or were crippled from polio every year. But the polio warriors I just mentioned then got together. And today, in 2019, about 35 years later, the number of cases of polio have just been reduced to about 350 per year in three countries only. Bill Gates Jr. joined the above group around 2005 and today is the largest contributor of funds to the onslaught. But all of the above agencies, Gates, WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, and Rotary, have now got together with other major countries to put in now $2.8 billion to ensure enough vaccines and vaccinators working round the clock to make polio the second disease to be banished from the earth by the year 2025. I mention this because here, an organization like Rotary is really redefining service. To show service without expectations or returns of any kind. Something needed doing. If not now, then when? If not us, then who? Immunization is done today round the clock every day of every month, come war or peace, come religious barriers or terrorist attacks, come any roadblocks, anytime, anytime, anywhere. It's really like a crusade, and it will be one. Of course, this mission of eradicating polio involves money. Yes, money is to meet the needs for service, not charity. Indeed, Rotary today helps motivate the world's countries which don't have any polio at all to support the cause with huge funds. Europe, Canada, America, Australia, Japan, all have risen to the cause of eradicating the disease. 
This is service for a cause, but without expectations of return of any kind, except, of course, the safety of the world's children. What we are doing here is what our ancient texts teach us. There is a verse in Isha Vasya Upanishad which says, Isha Vasya Idam Sarvam Yat Kinchit Jagatyam Jagat Tena Tyak Tena Bhunjita Ma Grida Kasyasvid Dhanam All this that we see, whatever moves in this universe, including the universe itself moving, is enveloped, clothed, and covered by the Lord. Described in another way, a person may have many different kinds of ornaments, but all are made from the one, the same gold, with different names and different forms. Truly, everything that one sees in this world is in service to the Lord. Everything, whether animate or inanimate. Animation here is medical service rendered by the doctors, for instance, to immunize children with inanimate vaccines. That is why perhaps we Rotarians enjoy whatever we have, whatever we do, knowing well that everything is impermanent. The Gita, of course, as we all know, says, Karmanya Vadi Karaste Mafale Shukadachana. We work and we do not worry about the results of the benefits in it for us. We go ahead, you and I, all of us. We do not attach ourselves to what we have, our wealth, but only do the good we can do. We redefine service our, through our karma, through whatever we do. As the Upanishad Mahavakya says, aham bham, aham brahmasma, brahmasmi, aham brahmasmi, the individual is always part of the whole. So serving the whole, serving others, serving the world is serving ourselves only. Each one of us is part of the whole and indeed indistinguishable from the whole. The Vedanta tells the story of Shankaracharya that illustrates this clearly. It tells about an ascetic hermit residing alone in a cottage in the forests. One evening, as he returns home from a walk outside, he sees the presence of a long poisonous snake as he enters this darkened room. So without delay, he beats the snake with the stick in his hands, many times till it is motionless and appears to have died. The hermit then lights a candle to see what he has done and realizes that what he has killed is actually a stick. He had mistaken it for a snake. The moral of this story is that reality, the truth, may be quite different from what we perceive casually. And we need to perceive the real truth rather than be swayed by Maya. The Almighty is the only presence, the real truth. And we need to realize this and ceaselessly search for it. Mother Teresa, who devoted her life ceaselessly to the service of the crippled, the dying, the most despairing of peoples, often picking them up from the gutters of Kolkata, said by giving solace to these desolate, desperate people, she was doing the work of God so they could depart in peace. Speaking at an event in the United States, she once said, you in America have everything. You have homes, you have work, you have money. But why don't you care for others enough? Your neighbors, the poor, the desolate, the deserted people. In London and New York, you only come to know your neighbor is dead when you see the bottles of milk pile up on his doorstep.
one wonders how did she ever get the strength, the patience, the determination to do all the work that she did. The answer comes from the Rig Veda, I suppose, which says that man alone acquires the strength of body and soul and attains happiness, whose heart is free of suspicion and filled with faith. The Dhammapada, the Dhammapada confirms that if a man's faith is unsteady, if he does not follow the true laws, if his peace of mind is troubled, he will never be perfect. There's a story about King Janak, father of Janaki, our Sita, who was known as a very just, very kind, very brave king who ruled Mithila with great valor centuries ago. He was once asked by a hermit, Maharaj, you have heard your, you have ruled your kingdom very well. That's what I have heard. I'd like to spend one day with you as you rule to see what is it that you do, to see how good you actually are. So Janaka said, all right, come with me tomorrow. Next morning, they both started going around the city of Mithila. But as they went, Janaka held at the corner of his mouth a small spoon filled with water. Well, the two of them went to the market, they went to the stables, they went to the university, they even went to the house of pleasure. The king spent time in his court too, spending a normal day. When they concluded at the end of the day, the king still had the spoon in his mouth and not a drop of water had spilled. The hermit said, O oh, king, I salute you for your absolute equability, your total stability in taking everything impersonally, but with absolute steadiness, steadfastness. You go through your days, your life, with perfect balance. All of us, each one of us, regardless of the service that we do, the good that we render, each one must eventually one day go. We must all die. When going, we try and we think of the Lord. Do we know where we will go? Each one of us certainly wants to know where he or she is destined to go. There's a story. One's a doll. Doll was made of salt. And this doll went to the ocean to measure its depth, the depth of the ocean. Alas, the desire was never satisfied. No sooner had it plunged into the ocean, it melted away. Similar is the condition of jiva, the individual ego, who, who even enters into the infinite ocean of the absolute Brahma. One day, Sri Ramakrishna Paramhans, the great saint from Bengal, was asked by a disciple, what happens after death? He replied, so long as a man remains in ignorance, in other words, so long as he has not realized God, he will be subject to rebirth. But after divine realization, one does not come back to this earth nor is he born in any other world. He went on. Potters, potters, those who make pots. Potters, for example, after making earthen pots, dry them in the sun. Have you not seen that there are pots which are baked in fire and others which are unbaked? When a pot of unbaked clay is broken, the potter uses the same clay to make a new pot. But if a baked pot is broken, 
the pieces are of no further use, and he throws them away. Similarly, when the ego is not baked, in the fire of wisdom, after death, it will appear in another form and be born again and again. If a fried grain is planted, it will not germinate. In the same manner, he whose inner nature is fried in the fire of wisdom is no longer subject to evolution, but attains absolute freedom from earth. So while going, leaving the earth, you think, you think of the Maha Mantra, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Today, as I enter the age of 78 plus, no matter whatever good I may have done as a Rotary president or in whatever way, whatever service I may have rendered in life with or without Rotary, I know I have soon to go and so I'm trying to prepare for it. It's like, it's like what a long distance marathon runner needs to get ready. If you are a distance runner, you need to prepare for it. Only then can you run the distance, okay? For the run to be good, to be smooth, only then you succeed. Someone once told me, go to temples if you must, but you will do better to keep chanting the mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Hare. Let me end today by quoting, O oh Lord, keep me not in the unreality of the bondage of the world, but lead me towards the reality of the eternal self. O oh Lord, keep me not in the darkness of ignorance, but lead me towards the light of spiritual knowledge. O oh Lord, keep me not in the fear of death, but lead me towards immortality, gained by the knowledge of the immortal self beyond death. Om. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya, Mrityonma Amritam Gamaya, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Kalyan Bhai, on behalf of the Theosophical Society and our President Tim Boyd, I would like to extend you many, many thanks for coming all the way from Bombay and delivering this address. Hearing about Theosophy and Rotary together from you made me feel very happy and I was so happy to see how close to each other the two organizations are. I think you took us all on a wonderful journey of service about self. And I'm sure any Besant, wherever she is up there, would be very happy that her any Besant lecture has been delivered today with this subject and with the contents that you gave us. Thank you very much. Uh, the meeting is now adjourned.